Good morning. I'm uh, Don Presley, the pastor of Brookhaven Baptist. Uh, here at Brookhaven, we're located at 1294 North Druid Hills Road in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, near the intersection of North Druid Hills and Peachtree. We're glad that you joined us today. Our church meets every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for Bible study. We have a Bible study for everyone, including children. And then we meet 11 o'clock for morning worship. Our worship is contemporary. It's uh, praise and worship. It's prayerful. It's worshipful. It's wonderful. Our, as you'll see in a minute, as you uh, look at our service today, you'll see that our praise team is fantastic. We have a lot of ministries going on in our area. Uh, every evening at 5 o'clock, we do celebrate recovery. We have a worship service, uh, that a new worship service that we're going to be beginning on June the 2nd at 6 p.m. Uh, that way, if you want to spend Saturday and Sunday with your family and then still worship God, you can come to our worship service at 6 p.m. It'll be the same, basically, that what occurs at 11 a.m. That's something new in our church. It's just, it's just going to be beginning. Uh, in addition, uh, we've got uh, coming up on June the uh, 2nd, June the 3rd, our Upward Basketball and Cheerleading Camp. And I hope that you will register your children and bring them up here. It is a fantastic camp. It's Christ-centered camp, and it really ministers to your kids. I want to ask you a question today to lead up to the, the sermon series that we're going to be preaching. The next four weeks, we're going to be in the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And this is the question I want to ask you today. Do you know Jesus Christ? The sermon series that we're going to be preaching through the next four weeks is knowing God in the fullest. And so the question today is, do you know Jesus Christ? Now let's join our service, which is already in progress. God bless you.
praise this morning. I mean, you're thankful, thankful for him today. What a privilege we have to worship him this morning.
Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Bibles this morning. I've made a little change from your hand out there. And uh, we're going to begin actually in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. And you say, Brother Don, I thought we were studying uh, Colossians. And we are going to be studying Colossians for about the next four weeks. Uh, but we're going to begin this morning in Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse uh, 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and through 23. We'll do a little test here. As soon as you find that in your Bible, stand up. 
Daphne is first one up. You win the sword drill today. We've got a special prize back in the in the sword drill room for you when you get that's pretty cool. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. This is the basically the next to the last point that Jesus makes in his Sermon on the Mount. Most people think the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5. It's not. It's chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. And so Jesus says this uh, to the crowd that was listening. He says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter to the king into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. My question to myself and to all of you today is this. Do you know Jesus Christ? It's a big question. It's the most important question in our life. Do you know Jesus Christ? Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have let us know you to the fullest. I pray, Lord, as we study through the book of Colossians, that you will draw us even closer to you through your Holy Spirit and through your word. Jesus, we love you, and we praise your holy name. And the congregation said, Amen. Thank you. Be seated. I've listed a couple of verses there that uh, you can look up when you go home. Let me just talk through them with you. I listed Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 16. Uh, this was when Jesus was in the north part of Israel. And uh, he asked uh, uh, his disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter spoke up, says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So Peter was the first one to profess faith in Jesus based on who he really was. Jesus the Christ, that means the redeemer of God, the son of God. Then I've got here John chapter 8, verse 32. And if you've never read through the sermon that Jesus preaches to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, you should read it. It is quite remarkable. Uh, but in John chapter 8, verse 32, the most famous verse in there, Jesus says, you shall know the truth, finish it with me, and the truth shall set you free. And he was putting himself forward. Now listen, this is important for everything we're going to study in the book of Colossians. He was putting himself forward as the truth of God. And that's important. He was putting himself forward as the truth of God. Without Jesus, in other words, there is no truth. In Jesus is all truth. Then he goes on in John chapter 14, 6. He's trying to comfort his disciples. He's telling them that tomorrow he's going to be crucified, uh, but them not to worry. And he says this. He says, uh, he says I am the way. You can, you can say this one with me too. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Jesus is the one that said, not Southern Baptist, not our convention, not the GBC, not the North American Mission Board, not our International Mission Board. Jesus is the one that said he was the way, only way, to the Father. Then you've got uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and you know this one. Uh, it's at the end of a sermon that uh, uh, Peter was preaching to people gathered at the, at the temple. He was preaching it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he said, There is no other name under heaven whereby men can be saved. Now, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, Jesus made this point, his apostles made this point, that there's only one name under heaven whereby men can be saved, and that name is what? Jesus Christ. That's right. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11 says, Every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, every knee under the earth shall bow to Jesus Christ and proclaim him what? Lord. I just paraphrased that. That's what it says. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 through 6, it says, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the Jesus Christ our Lord. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ our Lord. Can it be any more clear than that who Jesus Christ is? He is the way, the truth, and the life. However, over the last 2,000 years and really beginning at the very beginning of the Christian age, 
even within the first 10 or 15 years after Jesus had been resurrected from the dead, had gone back to heaven, and the apostles had begun to preach around the, the Roman world, basically at that time, some of them had gone to the east, but most of them around the Roman world. Religion, and even people within Christianity, began to pervert the truth. They began to pervert the truth of who Jesus is, and when you pervert the truth in general, you pervert the truth about who Jesus is because Jesus is the truth. I wrote down a couple of things here you might find interesting, is that God revealed in His Word basically uh, five basic inherent truths. And every person in here, man, woman, and child, every person in here, you had these truths in you when you were born. You say, no, 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 we learn everything that we know. No, 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 no. God put these truths in every man that has been born on this planet. And the evidence is, is what you see all over this planet from people that were disassociated with each other had the same truths. Listen to the five basic truths. Here's five basic truths that God has placed in every man. Every man knows these truths. Every man knows that there is a God who is the creator. That's in Romans chapter 1. They have not all worshipped him correctly as the creator. They became imaginative and vain in their thinking and worshipped him as something other than the true creator. Every man knows that there is an eternity. The evidence that every man knows that there is an eternity is that we think about it all the time. Animals don't think about eternity. Why? Because that knowledge is not in them. My dog, Colonel, basically thinks about his next meal or about his next walk, but he doesn't think about eternity. But we think about eternity all the time. And the older we get, the more we think about eternity because we're going to be going from life into eternity. So every man has the knowledge of eternity. The next basic truth that all men have is that there is human life and eternity after human death. The book of Job, which is the oldest recorded book in the Bible, not the oldest event, but the oldest recorded book in the Bible, Job in Job chapter 14 knew that after he died, there'd be something after that. He would wake up in eternity. And after his flesh decayed away to nothing, he knew there'd be something after that. And then the fifth truth, uh, fifth, the fourth truth is, is that all men know that they'll be held accountable by God in eternity for their sin on the earth. And men fight against this. How do they fight against this truth? They fight against this truth by denying the Creator. If there is no Creator, then there is no accountability. If there is no Creator and no accountability, then men can do whatever they want to do and there is no basic standard. That's what has pervaded our society. Don't you see that? That has pervaded our society, that false idea that there is no standard. In fact, what's happening in our society today is if you try to evoke a standard, you're so politically incorrect, it's unbelievable, and people will trounce all over you if you try to evoke a standard in our society. And the fifth truth that all men know about is that God will send a Redeemer to save man from his sin. God put that in man's heart all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And it's been there all this time. Job, in Job chapter 19, the oldest book in the Bible, Job knew that after he died, after his body decayed away, he knew he would see who? His Redeemer. The idea was there from the very creation of man, that man would sin, that man would need a Redeemer, and that God would send His Redeemer, His Christ, to save the world from their sin. And religion has perverted all five of those truths. Religion has taken those truths and each one of them, they've used each one of those truths and they've turned them this way and that way to the point that they've turned them away from the truth that is found only in Jesus Christ. Uh, religion, just to give you a definition of religion, religion is man's vain attempt to reach God. It's his vain attempt to reach God. And in that vain attempt to reach God, what man does, he creates his own God. He creates a God that fits into his patterns of logic. He, fits, he, he creates a God that fits into his, his own reasonableness. For example, everybody in this room has probably done this. When you see a tragedy, you see a child die, you see a child get leukemia, you see somebody killed, a young couple or a young wife or somebody killed in a car accident, the people that were killed in the bombings in Boston, you see a tragedy and people say, well, 
Some people will say that people that don't know Jesus, people that have no clue what's going on, they'll say, well, a loving God would not have allowed this to happen. You see, they try to create a God that they can understand. They try to create a God that they can control. They try to create a situation where they can reach a God that they can know and control because under their own rules and under their own regulations. Well, brothers and sisters, I'll tell you right now, the only way we reach God is through Jesus Christ. That is God's rules, not our own. Nobody is going to see God unless they go to God through Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you why we're going to be studying the book of Colossians, where the basis of the book of Colossians comes from. Uh, so we're going to go to our next point here. Colossa is in the country of Turkey today. It used to be called Persia. There's no real record that Paul ever went there. But Paul preached for two years at Ephesus, which is near Colossae. And probably a guy by the name of Epaphras heard Paul's preaching, got saved, and he went back to his hometown of Colossae and he evangelized the town in the name of Jesus Christ. Archippus was the first pastor there. He had a church that met in his home. That's how the original churches met. They met in homes. Uh, Epaphras, the reason this letter was written, Epaphras journeyed to Rome when Paul was in prison. Remember we studied in Philippians that Paul was in prison, in Mamertine prison. Uh, Epaphras journeyed to Rome uh, to visit Paul and to bring in some things that he needed from the Philippian church. And uh, there he gave the report to Paul that uh, this uh, perversion of religion called Gnosticism. Everybody say Gnosticism. This perversion of Gnosticism was creeping into the church in Colossae. So what did Paul do? He wrote this letter to the Colossians. He wrote another letter to the Ephesians. He wrote another letter to the Laodiceans. And he wrote a letter to Philemon. And he gave those letters, uh, he gave those letters uh, to these guys, Tychicus and Onesimus. And they took these letters back to Colossae, Ephesus, uh, Laodicea, and then took it to the person Philemon. Now what is Gnosticism? Gnosticism is from the Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. Anybody in this room who speaks English, raise your hand. Okay, very good, since I'm preaching in English, that's a good thing. Everybody in this room has heard this word before. You've gone to the doctor, and the doctor said, hey, that you got this, you know, uh, you, your, your toenail's going to fall off, and then, you know, this and that and the other, and you'll say, well, doctor, what's the prognosis? And it's actually prognosis is what it really is. That means what's going to happen in the future. So that comes from this root word, Gnosticism. It's about knowledge. And what this really was, it was about a secret society. I suppose it'd be kind of like the Masons today. And if you're a Mason, I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm just trying to use you as an example. It'd be kind of like the Masons today or some secret, the Knights Templar, or all those secret societies through history. And they had the knowledge of how to go from the darkness of the flesh to the light of the Spirit. And those are two key words. They had the secret knowledge that if you were one of them, if you joined their society, you had to pay some money, kind of like Scientology. You know, you got to pay a bunch of money to get from the darkness of the flesh to the light of the Spirit. Now, you got to get this. If you don't get anything else, you got to understand what Gnosticism is because that Gnosticism is everywhere in our society. Gnosticism has been in the church, still is in the church, has been in the church for 2,000 years, and you've got to understand this. So Gnosticism then believed that everything that was of this life, everything of this flesh, everything of our souls was darkness and was evil. And that there was a, uh, a, a, a course, a path, a bridge, whatever you want to call it, between the evil flesh and the pure, good spirit of heaven. See the perversion of the five truths that every man knows? They saw that there were seven gates of progress that people made from the darkness to the light. And these seven gates were basically kind of like their own little seven worlds, a little seven spheres. And each sphere was a heaven. And each heaven was controlled by an angel. Ever hear the, of the seventh heaven? That's where this idea comes from. There were seven heavens, and so what each man needed to do, they needed to join this society so they could traverse from one heaven to two heavens to three heavens, the, the fourth heaven, the fifth heaven, the sixth heaven, the seventh heaven until they got to God. That's what Gnosticism is. That 
seven steps, seven gates, seven spheres, seven angels. That was called the Pleroma. Everybody say Pleroma. You say, big deal. It is a big deal. And the Bible is translated fullest. The Gnostic said, well, Jesus is just one step from sin to God. And Paul says, no, Jesus is the entire step. Jesus is the entire pleroma, the step from sin to God. Do you see the point? In other words, Jesus is put forth by Paul as the God in the fullest. And the word fullest is the word pleroma. So that's what's going to happen here. Paul is going to confront this, this Gnosticism head on. Gnosticism consisted of people that believed in mysticism. That's people that worshipped angels. About, what, 10 years ago, everybody that could write a book wrote a book about angels. Even Billy Graham wrote a book about angels, about the worship of angels. Uh, mysticism was about the evolutionary process where you started as a bumblebee and you ended up in heaven, you know, that process. Uh, I think Shirley MacLaine fell into that one, you know. Uh, that's what mysticism is. We call it reincarnation today, but it, it began as mysticism. You got asceticism, which is a whole different thing. That's where you sit in a closet, stare at, stare at your belly button, and if you do that long enough, you deny your flesh long enough, your soul is translated to heaven. That comes from all the Eastern mysticisms, all of them, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, reincarnation, etc. They all come from that. That's, what, that's where that is. Uh, every religion today, every single religion today is a form of Gnosticism. Every single one of them. Here's what Gnosticism does, though, to Christianity. Number one, it denies the deity of Christ. About uh, 450 A.D., the church was so confronted by Gnosticism that they held a council. It was not their first council, but they held a council in Ephesus at the Basilica of Mary. I've been in that basilica. It's just ruins now, but they held a conference there, a council there, ecumenical council, whatever you call it, one of those, the Catholic things. And there they decided that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God, and that He is deity. And up to that point in time, it was debated throughout the church whether or not that was true. And they changed the Apostles' Creed to incorporate in there the fact in the Apostles, if any of you guys came from liturgical services, etc., you've said the Apostles' Creed, they came to change the fact that Jesus was deity to confront the Gnosticism that was saying, no, Jesus is not deity. He's just another angel in the chain. It's like uh, Muhammad. Muhammad believed in Jesus, but he didn't believe that Jesus was deity. See what I'm saying? He didn't believe that Jesus was Son of God, but he did believe in Jesus. He believed God translated Jesus alive into heaven, that Jesus will come back and lead the world into Islam, and then Jesus will die. So a perversion of who Jesus is. They also, Gnosticism denied the Trinity of God. You've got religions within that are claiming to be Christian religions that deny the Trinity of God. The Jehovah's Witnesses deny the Trinity of God. They deny the deity of Christ. The Mormons deny the deity of Christ. They deny the Trinity of God. There's, there's people out there that claim to be Christians that deny this because what? Gnosticism has, has seeped into their beliefs. You say, Brother Don, why is this important? It is important because this kind of perversion that has slipped into the church for 2,000 years has watered down the message of Christ. So much so that people today, when you tell them the truth, that it's only through Jesus that you come to God, they look and you say, Ah, you're just a mean old man. You Southern Baptist, you think that's a lie? That's what they think about us. They think we're just being mean-spirited when we say things like that. They do. And yet it is the absolute, 100% guaranteed truth of the Word of God. But the truth has been perverted. See, Satan couldn't, Satan couldn't defeat the truth himself. He couldn't defeat Jesus himself. Jesus stomped all over Satan and stomped all over his kingdom and took his kingdom away from him. So the only chance that Satan has got, he's, he's going to end up in hell, but the only chance he's got of delaying that is taking as many people with him as pro possible. And the only way he can do that is to pervert the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Gnosticism also denies the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I cannot believe it when I hear people say they believe in Jesus 
but they have a, have a hard time believing in the resurrection. And I want to call them up on the phone and say, hey, you're not saved. Because our confession of faith says we believe in Jesus and that God raised him from the dead. We confess him as Lord and we believe that God raised him from the dead. They de uh, Gnosticism denies that Jesus is the only way to God. I've already explained that. They denied, Gnosticism denies that salvation by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus alone is the only way to God. So, the church has been entangled with this a long time. There was a movie came out. I never watched the movie. Um, created a big stir in the church. I forget. It was uh, Tom Hanks and somebody uh, uh, in Rome. What was that called? That, the Da Vinci Code, yeah. And a lot of that movie was based on a gospel, uh, the Gospel of Thomas. Has anybody ever heard of the Gospel of Thomas? The Gospel of Thomas was not written by Thomas, by the way, but it was that, that the, the works of Thomas, the acts of Thomas, Thomas the contender, things like that were found at a place over in Egypt called the Nag Hammadi Library. And so people began to say, well, see, you got their four Gospels, but here's Thomas, and he wrote this Gospel. Well, he didn't write that Gospel. And I'll tell you what reason I know that, gospel, that Thomas didn't write that Gospel. Where did Thomas die? He died in India proclaiming the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But because he was called Doubting Thomas there at the first Sunday that Jesus uh, appeared and he wasn't there, everybody, all the pro-genosis people, they wrote all their doctrine and called it the gospel of Thomas. It is pure Gnosticism, uh, but every time somebody wants to say the gospels are false, what do they do? They pull out the gospel of Thomas. So in this book that we're going to study today, begin studying today, and I don't know how far we're going to get along in it, but we're going to get along pretty far, uh, at least six or seven verses. Uh, in this book, Paul is going to confront Gnosticism head on with the truth of who Jesus Christ is. So let's begin. Paul, an we're in Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To the saints, if you're here today and you're a saint, say amen. Now, nobody's going to put hood ornaments of you on their cars, but you are saints. Saint just means that you've been set aside when you got uh, born again and the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you. That means God set us aside to be His. That's what a saint is. It means set aside. It means sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Faithful brethren in Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, we don't have time to look it up, but Hebrews chapter 2, if you look it up, it's in the, the verses are in your handout. Jesus calls us His brethren. He says that through the Holy Spirit, He declares the gospel to His brethren in the church. It says His brethren are in Christ. Now that's, that's key right there. You got to get that. If you're listening, say amen. You got to get that in Christ. If you're here today and you are truly saved by Jesus Christ, then you are in Christ. See, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He says, many are going to come to me at that day and say, Lord, Lord, and I'm going to look at them and say, I never knew you. Which means that word new, genosko, which is a takeoff of the word gnosis, it means you were never in connection with me. So if you're here today and you're a true believer in Christ, you've been born again, you are in spiritual connection with Jesus. We are in Christ. We don't just know about Christ. We are in Christ. There's a huge difference. There's a lot of people that know about Christ who are not in Christ. There's, a people, there's people that attend church services every single week who know about Jesus but they're not in Christ. That's like little kids in Sunday school before they reach the age of accountability. They know about Jesus. They love Jesus, but they're not in Christ until they get saved and they get born again by the Holy Spirit into Christ. Let's continue. Paul says here, my brethren in Christ, uh, and then he says, grace be unto you and peace. You can't have peace unless you first got what? Grace. Say that with me. You can't have peace unless you first got what? Grace. You can't have peace by yourself. You've got to have the grace of God living and abiding in you. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So right off the get-go, Paul confronts Gnosticism and the idea 
that there is no trinity. Down here in verse uh, 8, he says, we also declared unto, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So right there in the first eight verses, he talks Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. We as Christians do not worship three gods. We worship one God. But they manifest themselves to us as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you witness to Muslims, they're going to say, you Christians worship three gods. We worship one God. And I'll say, no, we worship one God, but we know who He is. We know the Father from whence He came. We know the Son who manifested the Father to us. And we know the Holy Spirit who makes God a reality in our life. And they don't have that. I tell you what, when I was in Russia in 1994, we saw 800 people saved in, eight, in about, about 10, days, 10, 10 days of evangelizing time. And the reason we did is because they had all been baptized when they were old enough to be baptized in the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. And they, they, they call themselves Christians. Catholics in South America call themselves Christians. Baptists in North America call themselves Christians. But they didn't know Jesus. And these Russians didn't know Jesus. And that's what we hammered at them. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Have you been born again? And they will say, we don't know what you're talking about. Please explain that to us. What does it mean to be born again? And when we explained to them that's to be in connection with Jesus, it just blew them away because that was not existent in their life. We explained that they could be connected with God, that they could feel God's presence, that they could talk to God and He would talk back to them without them going through a priest. That they were their own saints and they didn't have to go worship these wood icons, which was scary. I saw that. That was just scary stuff. That they were their own saints. They had their own access to God through their high priest, Jesus Christ. Well, let's go on. Now, verse 3 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love. For, and then verse 5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of the Lord through uh, of the truth of the gospel. So, he was praising them for their faith, hope, and love. None of, you, none of us are going to come into the kingdom unless we ex receive God's grace through faith. So if we're born again, we've all had faith. And hopefully we're acting in faith because we can't please God unless we're acting in faith and living in faith. Hopefully all of us are living in hope. There's no other people on this earth who have hope like we do. Our hope is eternal. Once we are born again, we're eternally guaranteed that we're going to make it. If you're eternally guaranteed that you're going to make it into heaven because you're born again, raise your hand and say amen. amen. Hey, isn't that hope? What else, can you, what else can you hope for? In this life, there's nothing that's guaranteed. i got to go 21 miles home, and it's not guaranteed at all that I'm going to make it there. People that get up every morning. This guy that was driving down the interstate out here, or was it a woman? I can't remember that the tire came off the truck and came across the median and killed them right in their own vehicle. He or she, whichever one, did not expect that to happen. They didn't get up that morning knowing that was happening. Nothing in this life is certain. What is certain in this life is if we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and He's living and abiding in us, what is certain is, is that we'll see God through Jesus Christ because our Lord and Savior who lives in us through the Holy Spirit is the only way to God. And that is what we hope for. And love, the evidence, the evidence that we are saved is that the Holy Spirit is changing us to the point that we can begin to love the unlovable. Not just those people that love us, but people that don't love us, people that dislike us. There's something in us that says, hey, even though I don't like this, even though I don't like the way that person treats me, something in me saying, hey, I need to love that person anyhow because Jesus told me to and the Holy Spirit's teaching me to do that. And Paul was rejoicing at the love that he saw in the people at Colossae. Let's go on, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge, need to circle that word knowledge, of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now the word for knowledge, now look here, the word for knowledge in verse 9 is different than the normal word for knowledge. Remember, the word for knowledge for the Gnostics comes from the word gnosis. Everybody say gnosis. 
That's knowledge. Secret knowledge. The word that Paul uses in verse 9 is epinosis, which means full knowledge. See, listen here. Everybody's got those five truths in them. Everybody has those five truths in them. But if they don't have the truth living in them, they only know partially about those truths. If somebody doesn't have the truth, Jesus Christ, living and abiding in connection with them through the born-again experience, yeah, they know about eternity. Yeah, they know that they're sin. Yeah, they know that they're accountable to God. Yeah, they know there's a creator, but they know it with partial knowledge. If you look at all the religions of the world, they're all filled with partial knowledge, but not complete knowledge. Jesus says, basically what he said in Matthew 7 is, those of, the, those of you that come to me with partial knowledge, I don't know you because you don't know me. But Paul says, those of us who are born again, we have full knowledge of the truth. We have the full knowledge of God living in us. We have the full truth of God living in us. We have the full understanding of God living in us. We have the full wisdom of God living in us. And in Proverbs chapter 8, it tells us that wisdom and, un the wisdom and understanding and knowledge of God is better than gold, silver, or precious stones. In Proverbs chapter 8, it tells us that Jesus is the truth of God. Jesus is the expression of the wisdom and understanding of God. So when we are in Christ, we are in the truth. When we are in the truth, we have the full knowledge of God. Let's go on. Verse 10 that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Here's how you walk worthy of the Lord. You walk in ways that please Him. You walk in ways that are fruitful, which means you do good works. You walk in ways so that you increase your knowledge of God. All of us in this room, we have the full knowledge of God in us, but it's as we study the Word, it's as we pray, it's as we apply that knowledge to our life, as we apply Christ to our life, as we get into problems, as we get into challenges in our life. All of these things we learn more and more and more about God until the day that we come face to face with Him. We're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. I think it's a pretty good idea that we know Him as good as we can before we get out of this life. What do you think? I, I don't want to meet a stranger, amen? And you don't either. See, there's a lot of Christians that are going to get into heaven. They are born again. But Jesus is still basically a stranger to them. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Let's go on now. Let's look at verse 12. Verse 11 says, Strengthened with might according to His glorious power. Now, I was going to have us all say Ephesians 6.10, Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. We all know that though. We have the might of God in us. We have the power of God in us. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, And, the Holy, and after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, ye shall receive what? Power through the Holy Spirit. And we have that, every one of us in this room. You might feel like a weak, wimpy Christian, but if the Lord calls you to do something, you have the power and the might of Jesus to do it. Now, my favorite, one of my favorite memory verses from about 30 years ago is verses 12 through, 13, 12 through 14. Paul says, giving thanks, that's Eucharist, giving thanks unto the Father who has made us fit to be partakers of the saints in light. We didn't start out that way. We started out as unfit, sinners. But we've been transformed from sinners to saints. Therefore, we are now fit to receive the inheritance that God has reserved for the saints in light. We are now saints. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. In other words, that word delivers means we've changed, he's changed our place. We were one with the power of darkness. Today, we are one with the light. Jesus is the light. And all of us who are in Christ, we are the light. He has translated us from the powers of darkness and has what? He's translated us into the kingdom of His Son. He's taken us from the darkness that was the flesh, that was the world, and He's translated us into what? The light of His Son, Jesus Christ. In whom you have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came to rescue his brethren. 
He came to pay the ransom for their sins. That's what redemption means. That means somebody's been kidnapped, held captive, until somebody pays the ransom. Jesus Christ paid the ransom so that we could be set free. He came specifically to save me. He came specifically to save you. He came specifically to save anybody that would hear the gospel, believe in the gospel, receive the gospel. He came to die on the cross, be resurrected from the dead, so that men could be saved from their sins and receive forgiveness of sin. Listen, I'm an honorary guy. I'll be the first to admit it, and then Debbie will be the second. But I'm going to tell you what, as honorary as I am, I've been forgiven my sins. The Bible tells me my sins are as far as the east as from the west. In Romans chapter 6, uh, Paul gives us the example that when we are forgiven our sins, it's like the act of circumcision on a male. And that flesh is thrown into the trash, never to be brought back again. Paul, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Now there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Even though I fail on a daily basis to live the kind of life that is pleasing to Christ. Anybody else in that category other than your preacher? Sure I do. But you know what? Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's the key. You have to be in Christ Jesus. Jesus. What we're going to try to get a handle on here over the next three weeks is what it means to be in Christ Jesus. It's my responsibility that nobody walks out of a service unless they're in Christ Jesus, or at least they understand what that means. It's not a, a common thing that's been said for about the last 25 years is that it's not a head knowledge, it's a what? A heart knowledge. It's not a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge. When I was 12 years old, maybe 10, can't remember, threw rocks at Debbie McDougal's window. That's my wife, by the way. Didn't know her until somebody told me about her. Threw rocks at her window, woke her up about 3 in the morning. We were all camping out, wandering around the neighborhood doing real mischievous things. And I threw rocks and woke her up. And so then I had a head knowledge of who my wife was going to be. I didn't know at that time. She didn't like me much, and I really didn't care for her a whole lot either, you know. And that changed. But now I have a heart knowledge of my wife. And we are in connection. It's the same word Jesus uses for each one of us as he uses for the marriage relationship. Does Jesus know you? And do you know Jesus? That's the key. Don't walk out of here today unless you're certain that you're in a proven connection with Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for saving us. I thank you for sending Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for sending us the truth. And I thank you, Lord, for transforming our lives by the truth living and abiding in us. Lord, I pray that nobody leaves here today who's not in connection with you, Lord Jesus, as their Lord and as their Savior. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would take control of this invitation time, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to everyone that's here. Confirm in the hearts and minds of every person here who is saved, confirm in their mind that they are saved beyond a shadow of a doubt, that their calling and election is sure. But Lord, if there's somebody here today that is not saved, they are not in connection with you, then I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them of their sin, trouble their spirit, cause them to understand that they need you and that they need to be born again. Lord, we'll leave this to your Holy Spirit to discern and determine who those folks are. We love you, Lord, and we praise your holy name. Amen. Let's all stand up. It's invitation time. I pray as you sing that you'll allow the Holy Spirit to show you whether or not you're really saved. And I pray that if the Holy Spirit begins to trouble you, that there's a chance that you're not saved, that you will deal with that. And this is your invitation and your time to deal with that. So let's sing. What are we going to sing, fellas? Turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full. And the 
that's what we need to be doing this week. We need to turn our eyes towards Jesus. We need to think about Jesus all week. We need to connect with Jesus each day. Nobody in this room has any busier days than me. Nobody. I mean, maybe you're as busy, but to be honest with you, I'm busy, busy, busy. And it's really easy when you're busy, busy, busy to turn your eyes on your situations, your work, your family, and turn your eyes off Jesus. So what we want to concentrate on this week so that we're not only in a proving connection of Jesus, but we're fellowshipping with Jesus. We want to turn our eyes upon Jesus. So we're going to sing this one more time, and we're going to sing this as a commitment to Jesus, that we're going to stay as close to Jesus this week as we possibly can. So let's sing to Jesus. Let's sing this commitment to him. Then we'll have a prayer. Then we'll go to the house. Let's sing, fellas. Here we go. Everybody sing. Let's go. Your eyes upon Jesus. mom is here today. Everybody, if you know Horatio, say amen. 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 He's a good guy. Amen. But he, but he didn't get there by accident. He's there because his mom helped him get there. So Horatio, would you dismiss us today, please? Lord, I pray that you will teach us, Lord, how to, how to be in your spirit, how to stay in your spirit. Teach us, Lord, to let us know that you are the one in our life who controls our life. Lord, help us as we, uh, on our daily journey, help us to understand that you are the one that we need more than anything. Lord, I pray that as we go uh, into our lives, into our week, just keep us, Lord, uh, within your care. Remind us, Lord, that we need you every day and not just Sunday or not just some days, but every day. Pray, Lord, for those who wanted to come here and couldn't be here. Pray, Lord, that uh, we be able to reach those. Lord, I just pray for this church, for this community. Just pray for those who are in need of you in ways that we can't reach them. Thank you, Lord, for all you do. And may Jesus lead us in our daily life. In Jesus' name we pray.